Hello friends, welcome to episode 8 of InsureTech LA. My name is Gilad Shai and this week my guest is Ryan Mattison, CEO and co-founder of Glovebox. Ryan, based in Denver, grew up in the insurance industry. He was able to help grow the family agency by 95 million in premium, expand to 10 states and grow to over 200 agents. In August of 2019, they sold the agency and started Glovebox. Please join my conversation with Ryan, where we chat about chalk holes, being pro-agent, wearing an astronaut uniform in Vegas, and the future of Glovebox. Because apparently we are freestyling here, and it's yeah. working so well. Yeah. Now, I started recording, so people who hasn't joined the prep call, which of course you couldn't, right. we already touched about MMA, being choked by your wife, um, Denver, Los Angeles. We didn't touch traffic, but now we're talking about, you know, taking the ferry from New York to Jersey. Yep. Which yep. is amazing, right? But before we dive back to all of these super random topics, <laughs> Ryan, thank you very much for joining me today. It's, a, yeah. it's really a pleasure. So how about you give a quick introduction about Glovebox? What do you guys do? And then we'll talk about why the hell you, your wife, which is an amazing person, volunteered to put on an astronaut costume and work in Vegas. In, in the middle of September. <laughs> yes. In 110 degree weather. I think Caribou was her biggest fan, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, while we were out there. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me on, G. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to see you again, uh, obviously, during these quarantine times. Um, a little bit of my background, uh, you know, I'm an insurance guy. I come from the insurance space. My dad started an independent agency like 35 years ago out here in Denver, Colorado. I remember sitting at the kitchen table growing up, uh, helping him lick, you know, the stamps and the envelopes, sending out his marketing material, trying to drum up some business because the internet was not a thing. Um, it was all manual mail outs, uh, you know, mailing quotes, taking three days for it to get in the mail. And then you got to follow up, see if they got it. Um, so I grew up in the business. Um, I was always around insurance, never had an interest in it, could care less, uh, went to college, graduated in 2008 during the recession, which was not a great time to come out of college and try to, uh, get your footing as a professional. Oh, tell me um, about that. That's when I graduated my MBA. It was like nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Hey, I'm here. Oh, bummer. <laughs> the show's canceled. So that was, uh, that was interesting. I was actually going to move to LA. Um, I was uh, with a modeling agency out of Kansas City where I went to college and they wanted me to move to LA. And uh, thank God I didn't do that because I got a job out here uh, doing internet marketing, which kind of helped me along uh, the sales path. So did that for two and a half years. Then my dad came to me and said, hey, look, I want to grow the agency. I need your help. So I left that job in 2010, late 2010. And I started with the agency in 2011. Um, the agency, independent agency, um, little $5 million in premium shop. When I came on board, I think we had three producers, uh, a couple CSRs and, um, started out as an agent, uh, started selling insurance is the only way to learn just to get in the trenches and really, uh, kind of dive in sold for two years. Uh, second year really figured out how to market, uh, built up a nice book. I did about 2 million in premium over those two years. Uh, which was not bad for, for personal lines. Um, then I pivoted over to uh, helping to build our sales team, uh, built that up and kind of fast forward uh, eight years later, we sold our agency to a private equity firm last summer. Uh, we built it up to about a hundred million in premium over that 10 year span, nine and a half year span, over 200 agents, 10 States across the Western half of the U S including California um, uh, you know, put my dad on a beach in Florida and here we are today. So that's, that's my story. Yeah. Just next to Nick Lamparelli, who is sort of vacation working there, but that's a different story. There but, you go. But, yeah, no, yeah, that's the life. It's like, and I love Nick hilarious. I would, I would sit on a beach oh, any day man. with that guy. <laughs> no, he's one of the best. No, and seriously, yeah. I think that between moving to Florida or Arizona, that's where things are going. But before we jump into taxation, yep. I think that you touch so many, couple of very interesting topics, which is why would people, you know, become a producer, how to open an agency, the independent, the solo agent, 
And then, of course, selling an agency to a PE, that's, first of all, that's congratulations. Uh, we've you. seen more and more things like that yeah. between all the clustering and building the big groups. Yep. But before we take that turn, let's continue to talk about uh, Glovebox. So it's a family business. It's you, your brother. Then you got that guy, Sean. How Sean did that... with the crazy hair. Yep. <laughs> yeah. How did that happen? Yep. So uh, Sean's been a friend of mine since elementary school. So I've known Sean for a long time. And uh, the, the way I do business, the way I really operate, I like to be around people that I know, like, and trust. Um, I, I tend to hire a lot of people that I've grown up with. That's just who I gravitate toward. Um, it kind of weeds out the um, interview process for me. It's not a wild card. I know what I'm getting. Um, and at the end of the day, when you work with people that you have grown up with, you have uh, an extra layer of accountability right? You, you're accountable to them, their family, and uh, it makes people show up a little bit more, I think, than they would normally. So my brother was an easy choice. Sean was an easy choice. They both worked with us uh, at the agency. And mm -hmm. one day I came into Sean's office. I said, hey, we're selling this agency. Pack up your stuff. We're going to go start Clubbox. And so he's like, are you serious? I was like, yep, we're doing it. So he packed up his stuff and uh, that was our last day. <laughs> and so that's, uh, that, was, that was August of uh, 19. Yeah. And so by September, we had no office, uh, not really a technology yet, and uh, we were up and running. Yeah, because if I remember correctly, you started, it's coming soon, it's coming soon, it's coming yep. soon. And we were like, <laughs> yeah, what's coming? What's, what, what's happening? What exactly, yeah. what, what, are, what are these guys trying to sell us? Yep. And I think that the first uh, thing you, you sort of uh, branded it as the mint of insurance or something like that. Yeah. So what... What is Glovebox? Yep. To that point, we were masters of uh, selling the hype. Uh, we were out selling our developers, basically. Our developers were busy developing a product on the back end, and we didn't have anything else to do but market. So we were like, hey, we're going to start marketing. Um, so what we learned at the agency is this, and I really started out developing this the concept like three and a half years ago. We had about 40,000, 45,000 clients in our agency. and on a given month, we were getting anywhere from 13 to 14,000 service requests a month. I was staffing up anywhere from 30 to 35 CSRs just to handle the volume. And we couldn't even keep up. Whenever clients would call in, they needed something and they needed it right now. They didn't care how many people were waiting, how many people in queue, they wanted it. Um, and so I looked at our business and I was like, how is there not a technology that could offset some of these service requests? They're very nominal. Like people just want a copy of their policy. They don't remember who we wrote them with, you know, for, for consumers. And I think we forget as, as agents, consumers, it's not that they don't care about their insurance, but they only care about it when they're in the moment of needing it or having to deal with it. Other than that, it's, you know, compartmentalized somewhere with their taxes, right? Somewhere else. Um, and so they can't remember who we wrote them with. They don't know who to pay. They don't know who to call for service. Do I have to deal with the carriers? Do I have to deal with you? And so we really wanted to build something that created clarity for the uh, end user, which was the policy holder of saying, look, you can solve these simple service requests. Let us direct the points of communication based on how the independent channel operates. And thus we're going to offset a lot of these customer service requests that are usually coming into the agency. And so that was really the premise of why we created what we're building now. Um, and it's, it's evolved from there. Yeah, that's super cool. So, yeah where exactly does it stand today? Because on yep. your website, I see the white label, I see the services to the agents, if it's a solo agent or if it's an agency, yep. how do they use in, basically for me, it sounds very clear what's the value proposition in terms yeah. of, oh, I'm paying X and I'm saving so much time. Yep. But yep. how? So yeah, we've really evolved from thinking about Glovebox as uh, just a self-servicing platform to really solving the issue for agencies, everything after they sell the first policy to a client. Mm -hmm. so once you have a policy on the books with a client, that whole uh, communication point is really manual at this point, whether it be service, whether it be cross sell, whether it be renewal, whether it be reshop, or just general communication is really no good system that aggregates that post bind experience. And so what we're doing now is we're evolving to be uh, not just the self-servicing platform, but we said, hey, while we have your client's attention, let's help you cross sell more business. 
Let's help you get referred out to their friends and family. Let's help you as an agent be able to leverage your technology with their referral partners to get more business, to make it very easy to refer you out, right? Let's make it very easy for consumers to be able to request reshops. Uh, let's make it very easy for consumers, again, to um, you know, be directed with their service, with what they're trying to accomplish. If they wanna pay a bill, they're gonna pay it with the carrier, not with the agent, typically, uh, with agency bill policy. So let's direct that point of communication. So we've really evolved as being this, again, this front-facing platform for agents to leverage in multiple different ways. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I love the fact that you started, you know, you provide them with a small hook and yep. then started to build on that. And now you're providing that white, white label with all the services. Yep. So of course we'll need to ask what's next. The marketplace is coming next. Um, and we're very excited about the marketplace. So right now we're hundred percent personal lines focused life, health and commercial are coming live next month. Uh, so those are really big pillars for us. We call them pillars of policies that really completes our platform. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our mantra is clients should be able to manage all of their insurance in one place, anytime, anywhere from any device. Um, and so with life, health and commercial comes the marketplace. And so essentially what we're doing is we are evolving our UI within the platform to not only show the consumers where they can easily get their policy documents, which are coming directly from the carriers, where they can pay a bill, where they can start a claim, where they can communicate with their agent, but let's show them what policies they have. And more importantly, let's show them the policies that they don't have and show them a very easy way for them to get more insurance from their agent. And so that's kind of what we're bringing to the table. With that is gonna come digital integrations. Mm -hmm. So take any agency across the US, they usually focus on between one and two lines of business really well, right? They're, they're big and middle, they're large commercial, that's what they focus on, that's their niche, maybe they do some benefits. They're not going to really touch home and auto. That's not really what they like. You know, pet, travel, cyber, drone, uh, dental, vision, all these other lines of business that may, they maybe don't want to touch. Their consumers want to buy those. Then they want to buy them from the agent that they already know, like, and trust. And so for us with this marketplace comes these digital integrations of an agency saying, you know what, we don't want to touch pet insurance. We don't want any human beings work on, working on it because it's just not worth us uh, staffing up for that. Let's yep. enable it digitally within our app. Let Glovebox um, automate the process via push notification, text, and email to your clients, alerting them of the availability. And let's sell it, uh, quote, and bind 100% digitally in your platform and pay you the revenue. And so that's what's coming for us in 2021. That's very, very impressive. And I think that there is a great vision in terms of that, especially with the, well, the binding and the post binding yep. and actually catering for the agents. I'm let's call it a pro agent kind of guy. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious because earlier on, it was all about, Oh, we are going to move away the agents. We don't need any more. It's like, no, you need agents. You yes. Know, we're talking about um, 200,000 licensed agents in the US, 2 million work in the insurance industry. They are not going to disappear because there is always going to be a question mark. Yep. You always need a person. Try to sell annuities without an agent. Yep. Almost impossible. Try to sell commercial insurance. I'm not talking about workers' comp, but yeah. you will need even workers' comp, you will need. <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. Try to sell DNO and have explain that to a client and why they need DNO in a digital fashion and how it it's custom to their specific business. That's very, that's going to be difficult to digitize mm -hmm. with product lines. And I've done a lot, a lot of research on uh, kind of the future of the way insurance buying is going to go in the U S uh, you can look at places like Germany, which are ahead of the U S in my opinion, with, with how they're uh, structured consumers really fall in the middle of saying, look, I'm not going to hundred percent commit to a digital channel. I'm not going to hundred percent commit to an agent channel. I want a mixture. I want to buy specific products digitally and I want specific products with an agent. Why can't we marry the two? And that's what we're looking to do is we want to marry that experience for the consumer to say, look, you don't have to decide uh, between all in one way or all in another. Let's present you the options for both. And then you decide how you want to buy. And that's what we're doing. No, yeah, that's great. That's yeah. very, very great. And I love the vision. And because of that, I saw recently that you announced a partnership with as Noah, as Noah is, is a partnership that uh, 
we've been working on for a little while. Really excited about that. Um, we find a huge value in working with agency clusters, um, which I think you alluded to earlier is, is becoming more and more popular. 26% um, uh, of agencies now belong to clusters in the US. That's a pretty big amount. That's over 10,000 agencies. And this um, is where I need to stop you so you can yeah. give a quick explanation. What is an agency cluster? Great, great. Yeah, so uh, it's a pretty overlying term, but essentially an agency cluster is a group of agencies that come together. Mm -hmm. They pool their uh, premium uh, to really leverage it to get more market access. So carriers will say, oh, maybe that single agency isn't worthy of a contract with us. Put 10 of them together and now you've got premium that's worth a contract. And so it helps with market access. It helps drive bonuses with carriers, which is great. And it also helps uh, agencies mitigate loss ratio issues, right? Like here in Colorado where we get hail all summer and loss ratio issues are a problem or California with the fires. Places like Arizona or New Mexico or Utah where you don't see a lot of claims, um, you know, it helps offset a lot of those loss ratio issues, which again helps them get higher bonuses. So multitude of different reasons why an agency would join, but uh, they're becoming very popular. Which now of course I need to ask, Okay, so what's the difference between that and a wholesaler? Yep, so a wholesaler is uh, an MGA. So a wholesaler is going to be a single, think of them as a single agency that doesn't, they don't retail business, so they're not dealing with the end consumer. They're essentially specializing in specific products that agents can't get within the standard market. So think of a property down in Florida that's very high risk for flood. And so a traveler's a nationwide an ASI, they're not going to be interested in that piece of business. So that agent has to go to their wholesaler to say, hey, what markets do you have to cover this property? The wholesaler is going to offer them a quote based on their appointments that they have with typically carriers that are worldwide. Um, they send that quote back to the agent, then the agent sells it to the client. And that's, that's what a wholesaler is. Cool. No, thank you very much. Yeah. I always try to inject a little bit of insurance 101 because there are so many yeah. different spaces or well, yeah. the insurance industry is so complicated and we have these small nuances that we are always missing. And if we can inject also numbers, even better. Now, yep. going back to Glovebox and talking about you guys. So you've been around for a year, more or less? What yeah, the, right around 18 months. Yeah. yeah. And especially most of it was uh, during COVID, which is all about digital and not in person. Really yep. depends on in which state you are. Um, what have you seen in terms of growth and the adoption of the market to you? It's been overwhelming for us, um, the response that we've gotten. Um, we get four to five inbound demo requests a day right now from agencies. Um, we got four this morning. Um, the, when we show agents our products, uh, it's why we do this. It's so invigorating for us because they're blown away. They're like, oh my God, I've never thought about it like this. I, I, I knew the a problem, but I never knew the solution until you've shown me the solution. And this makes complete sense. Um, since March, uh, we actually launched our first agency the day we were going on stage at Plug and Play in San Francisco, which is ironic. I think it was the last in person that they did at Plug and Play. Uh, we have over 100 agencies live now. Uh, we just hit 22,000 users since March. Um, and we've got another 100 agencies coming live here in the next 45 days. Um, and that's Absolutely. maxing out our team. Yeah, we really can't handle any more than that. So yep. it's been that's overwhelming. And this is, if we have investors listening, this is the best time yeah. because you're now, you need to raise money in order to scale up. That's the beauty of it. And I have no idea if you're actually raising, yeah? Quick, we're uh, actually raising right now. We need to, uh, it'll be our first fundraise. Uh, we're hundred percent self-funded currently, um, which we're excited about. We, we self-funded the entire project to this point. Um, we want to get the marketplace built and the marketplace is going to be really, really good. And we want it done by uh, July of 2021 and into the market. And so that is uh, going to be a big project that we need to hire developers for. So, so for the entrepreneurs or for myself, more likely, um, why? So what was the reasoning behind that? In order to say, I'm going to put my own money. I'm going to work on that for 18 months. Yep. Validate the concept, validate the business, develop your, you're already past the MVP. 
Right. You're already in version, almost about to come out with version three. Yep. Right. You have web, you have iOS, you have Android, but that's just the UI. We're talking about the code integrations and the value proposition to the agents. Mm -hmm. you, sp you basically invested everything and the alternative cost from yourself. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to, to insurance. Why not to raise money before it? Um, so you mean raise money before, like from the beginning, mm -hmm. instead of putting in our own money? Yep. It had to be done through us. Um, I did not, in, in a very selfish way, I did not want anybody telling us in the beginning what our product should be mm -hmm. because we were agents. We, we're still licensed. We lived the world that we're solving. We have a very specific vision of what we would have wanted as agents and agency owners. And so everything we build is very eloquently thought out based on what we would have wanted. And I hated to have a side saddle in the beginning of maybe an investor that wanted to give us direction that maybe we didn't agree with. And so it gave us, it gave us really a sense of um, freedom to operate the way we want, to build it the way we want. You know, we can walk around ITC with a spaceman and, you know, we could be the only ones that get a cabana and host our meetings at the pool, right? I mean, that's just, that's how we operate. We are outside of the box. We're not straight laced by any means. And we are, as you mentioned earlier, we are so pro agent. We want to do anything and everything to make agents successful. And so that's why we wanted to use our own money. So we oh. could do it the way we wanted to do it. That's great. And I, I, I bring that up because you see one of the conversation, <clears throat> sorry, the conversations that I have with various founders, it's all about when should we raise? That's a huge question. It's about your valuation. It's part of it is the freedom because you still have control over your company. You may now have a board of three unless you're already at board of five and that will be, well, that's a different story. Yeah. Um, it's very, it's very interesting, you know, when is the right timing and can you do that? Can you actually occur all the expenses and all the stuff? It's great. It's, and you leverage it. And especially if yeah. you now you already verified as, as we know, most investors like to invest in Google after it has 80 million, $80 billion in revenue. It's easy to come in then, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, done. yeah. But I'll tell you what, those days, uh, you know, early this year, late last year, when we're writing $50,000 checks every month and, and, you know, we're not at sales at all. Those are some tough checks to write. You know, you got to validate that in uh, marketing, which is why we were so ambitious with our marketing. We, we, did, we didn't really have a product built. Uh, we had to validate the money we were putting in somehow. So, and that's kind of why we did what we did. Oh, that's great. I love it. It's uh, sometimes yeah. it's very hard to see, and I've been there, done that. You put your own money into a project and at the same time, yeah. it's like, okay, what can we yeah. do while we need to wait for that technology to be developed? Yeah, I love it. Yep. Yeah, so, technology is interesting. It's, uh, it's fickle to say the least. Yeah, how did you work with the insurance companies? It's a great question. In the beginning, not well. Um, they did not, respond well to our products. Uh, they did not like that we wanted to drive attention away from their platforms and put it back in the hands of the agents. They didn't get it. Um, you, know I mean? you know, they're very uh, set in their ways, as we know, for the most part. Um, if it's not broken, you know, don't fix it. But what we know about clients of the independent channel using the carrier portals to service is that that is the number one mistake in our business period it's bad for the uh, carrier it's bad for the agent and it's extremely bad for the client and here's why the first piece is revenue when a client is usually utilizing the carrier portals to self-service they are not allowed to cross sell any business because it's not their client it's the agency's client. So if my client is utilizing the, the Travelers app to manage their home policy, how does John Smith Agency, who owns that client relationship, offer that client more insurance when that client is utilizing the Travelers app, right? Mm -hmm. All they're seeing is service. They're not seeing any opportunity yep. to buy more insurance. That is minimizing significant revenue to everyone, right? They're minimizing that experience. 
Second piece is look at the service relationship and the independent channel. It's very segmented. Some things go to the carrier, some things go to the agency. Is the agency utilizing a service center or are they not? And so for a client to use, uh, just for instance, the Progressive app, they're getting 30% of their service needs met because any policy changes, any updates have to go back to the agency. And so now they're getting half, less than half of the experience that they need. The client is frustrated and confused. And that's if they only have one carrier. Imagine if they have mm -hmm. two, three, four carriers. It's, the confusion is ridiculous. Third one is um, for the agency, it's, it's really referrals. I mean, keeping your brand in front of your clients at all times is extremely valuable when it comes to getting referral business. And if your client is utilizing the Nationwide app, they're referring out Nationwide. They're not referring out the John Smith agency. They're saying, hey, you should, you should go with Nationwide. They're great. I use Nationwide. And so for those reasons, it's, it's such a bad business decision to have clients utilize the carrier portals because of all the barriers involved and the dynamics of the industry. And so really bringing that back to the agency and facilitating in a way where we can include the carriers and their self-servicing experience, but maximize the agency's exposure and cross sales and um, referrals is, is really the best way to do it. And so we feel really strongly about that. I love it. I love it. I think that you hit the nail on the head or a few nails in this case. And this is something that from the corporate side, not everyone sees it. Right. I remember early on, so we're talking about almost three years ago, I was talking to various uh, executive in, in different insurance companies, doesn't, no need to name names. Sure, sure. Um, it was all about, and still is, it's the customer journey. And when we were talking about how you can provide uh, embedding the insurance at the point of sale, uh, the digital, uh, the digital uh, customer journey, is, but it's not our journey. Yeah. They, that graph is like, it doesn't matter if it's your journey of, or not. At the end of the day, it leads to sales. It leads to upsell, cross-sell. It drives better leads. There is a certain fixation because they already invested tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to create the infrastructure and that user experience or what they like to call the journey, which is super important. However, that's not the way to work with the agents. You need yep. to include them, yep. which of course leads me to the following question about independent versus captives. And we see a trend here and wouldn't it be easier for you to go to a carrier and tell them, hey, you can buy this white label for all of your captives? Yeah, the, you know, the captive market is definitely not something that we're focused on. That's, they're very set in their ways. And honestly, we don't see at this point a fit. Now, the interesting thing about the captive market is we see uh, captive carriers, they're inching into the independent channel. They're, they're not doing it uh, loudly, but they're doing mm -hmm. it. I mean, Allstate, for instance, we won't mention names. How about this? There's a couple carriers that uh, they're setting up appointments with independent agents, right? Mm -hmm. So independent agents are now being able to offer their products in some regions of the U.S., which you know, makes it very dicey when it comes to being a captive agent thinking, oh, I sell one product while my counterpart across the street sells my product and 10 others. Like, how does that make me feel as an agent? Um, and then uh, another uh, captive who is actually letting their agency, um, or I'm sorry, their agents sell other products through other carriers if the risk doesn't fit with them. And the risk, that's a very loose term, right? So in my opinion, I think a lot of these captives minus the, the top, you know, two, which, you know, State Farm USA, I don't see them pivoting. Uh, they're inching toward the independent channel and I don't blame them because I think from a consumer standpoint, the value proposition of an independent agent is the strongest in, uh, in the market. So, um, And I love the fact that you as a CEO says, well, it's not a good fit for us at this point, yep. which is great. It's truly understanding. It's, it's a great maturity sign in terms of understanding this is our, our value proposition. This is our target audience. This is the, what we're focusing on. And later on, if maybe an opportunity, we'll also look at the, the captive. And right. we see a decline, in, a decline in the number of uh, captive or exclusive uh, agents and an increase in independent, especially. It's going to be a pendulum, right? 
Now we're going to see a decrease and increase. You have the clustering, the gorilla, the, the gorilla size uh, agencies, and it's going to move back and forth, back and forth. But each side, it's like 10 years at least. <laughs> Absolutely. It doesn't swing fast. It's an iceberg. No. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's going to move. But yeah, anyway. that's why it's for them to pivot. It's like, ah, oh, the, the ship's going one way. It's hard to turn around. <laughs> now, tell me, besides insurance, and, you know, let's add a little bit. We'll, we'll segue slowly to that. So how did you convince your wife to go into an astronaut suit in Vegas at 110 degrees? Yeah, uh, you know, she's, she's a team player, first and foremost. I mean, I, I want to say she uh, volunteered for the job. So uh, she saw the checks that I was writing, or we were writing mm -hmm. into the business. And she's like, hey, whatever it takes at this point, right, we're all in. So I think uh, that drove a lot of her um, uh, willingness to, to get in the, uh, the space suit. But she had fun. You know, ITC, if you have not been, uh, I know you've been, uh, if you haven't been, and when it opens back up, ITC is a lot of fun. We made a lot of good and interesting relationships over uh, a whiskey out at ITC. And I think um, for us, that was um, invaluable to just uh, us getting our name into the industry. So, uh, And most definitely you've done, you've done a great job in that. I would say this one in, I think a year earlier, a Hippo, has done, was it at ITC or a dig in? No, 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 I think oh, on ramp. Doesn't matter. The point is that what they've done was great. Asaf basically made sure that instead of having a booth, he brought his team, everyone had a hippo green shirt and this just started yep. running around and everyone saw green, which is such a great branding action. I love that. It's like, and yeah. listen, you're talking to a guy who brought a cow, a calf, and a milking goat to New York, to <laughs> Fifth Avenue and 59th. It's all I about the guerrilla marketing. I had, a, I had a gaming company back in the day, so we're talking about like... That's so cool, yeah. 2010, 2011, something like that. So it was all about how yeah. do we get attention and for free. Um, but long story. No, well, and then Bold, Bold Penguin followed suit at ITC in 19. So Bold mm -hmm. Penguin, they were walking around in uh, yellow Bold Penguin shirts. So that must have been a, a play off of uh, the Hippo uh, play a year prior. So. Well, Bold Penguin has, has invested a lot in marketing all, everywhere. I've seen in a couple of airports, I think mainly in um, uh, Iowa or something like that, and Des Moines and yeah. other locations that you land, you see the Bold Penguin and go like, yeah, that, we must have a lot of insurance here. If yeah. that's the target audience, yep. I love it. I actually spoke to Ilya the other day. He's got a similar background of uh, being in an agency. Yeah, so, yep. on the commercial side. And recently they made acquisition, which is a great question about, I think it's covered genius. One of the- one of uh, the Risk genius. Chris risk genius, genius. And yes. Fellow Jayhawk, so I love Chris. <laughs> yes, sorry for that. Risk genius is someone else. It's a no, cover genius. Jesus. Too many covers, too, many, too geniuses. many geniuses in the business. Yeah. <laughs> too many geniuses and risk genius, which if memory serves me right, it's all about an AI to understand the risk and the policy, which sounds something that will be very beneficial for you for your next next step of understanding the upsell. So it's funny. I, uh, I first met Chris out in New York uh, at a conference last year. Uh, I can't remember what conference it was. I can't remember. I, I had emailed him and said, look, I'm a fellow Jayhawk. I have to meet you. And he was like, okay, cool. Let's meet. And uh, I met him and just the salesperson in me and the, the products person in me, I started pitching him right away. I was like, look, Chris, we need you. We need your help for this. We need, you know, uh, consumers are confused. They have no clue what coverage does, what it is, what they should buy, what they shouldn't buy. We need your system to uh, convert over to personal lines so we can integrate you so that we can help uh, educate our consumers. And he was pretty, he's like, ah, no, that's not, you know, that's not our, uh, our niche at the moment. Um, Cause obviously he's focused on commercial, but I see a huge opportunity with someone like Chris uh, in general with what he's doing with, um, not just the broker side education when you get a quote in from a wholesaler and you're like, this thing's 30 pages. Like, 
hopefully it's what I wanted and what I asked for and the coverage that I need, but most agents just send it out. Hey, the premium looks good. It's better than what they're currently paying. Sell it. Um, and so his product is, is great for uh, the agent side of things. It has huge value, in my opinion, on the consumer side. And, and I'm hoping at some point I can convince him to, uh, to play that side of the fence as well, because I think uh, it would be really well accepted. Mm -hmm. so. no, I completely agree. There is a lot of opportunity, with, especially with AI. And what can you automate when the agent is not around? Or just it's a, telling the agent, hey, you should look over there. There is an yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Right? But they, they put this stipulation in the policy language that you don't want. And mm -hmm. if anything, agents need to be addressing that with their clients because obviously it's an E&O exposure. If you're not explaining that to your clients sufficiently, they could come after you. Now, whether they'd have a claim or not is, you know, you kick that ball. Um, yeah, well, I'll ask Patrick Callahan what he thinks about that. But um, at the end of the day, you know, agents need to understand policy language and be communicating effectively. So I love what Chris is doing. I think it's great. So if there is any AI company that wants to talk about that, let me know. And we'll also bring Patrick because he has an opinion about that stuff. <laughs> I love Patrick's opinions. <laughs> He's one of the most knowledgeable people in insurance that I've ever met. He, he, his depth of knowledge is insane. Yeah, no, most definitely. Yeah. So talking about AI, we'll, talk, um, we'll give a shout out to Relativity 6 because they do AI different, in a different space, but the connection here is Muay Thai and MMA. So. <laughs> Uh, who was that? Your brother who got choked? Sean, my business Sean, partner. Sean, sorry, Sean sorry, got, sorry. Yeah, he so. got choked by his wife, and she was at my house the other day. Our kids were playing, uh, and she had the video evidence, and I saw Sean get choked out. And uh, it was a reverse guillotine that was, it was deep. So he was in trouble. <laughs> so you're dealing with, so you're doing MMA, Muay Thai. He's being choked by his wife. Yep. We can take that to the direction of uh, an episode in billions, but we are not going to do that. <laughs> great show, great show. I, they stopped in the middle of the fifth season. I know, I know, and it's only getting better as well. I know, I know. But so how long have you been doing MMA? I've been doing MMA for six, six and a half years now. Um, I, I, my wife is like, hey, we should go to a kickboxing class. I was like, ah, oh, that sounds awesome, let's do it. Um, so did that kept on the path, started evolving, went to um, uh, a gym uh, in town here that was, uh, there's some UFC fighters that train at that gym. Then I started doing, um, the heck is it called? Uh, oh, I can't remember the discipline now. Um, Krav Maga. I, I dipped Krav into Maga. Krav Maga for a bit, which if you've never done Krav Maga, these are the most serious human beings on planet earth. It's so hilarious like, you know, to hear people pronounce it this way. Yeah, cool. It, oh, it's, oh my gosh. Yeah, you could have your grocer from the grocery store and, you know, a 60 year old, uh, you know, single mom in there that's literally, these are, these are serious people. So Krav Maga was an interesting experience. And then uh, finally, I landed at my gym now. I train at Factory X in Denver. Um, it's awesome. My kids do jujitsu there. Uh, a lot of UFC fighters train there. My coach is uh, 145 in the UFC. Wow. Um, and I've been there for almost two years now and, uh, I'm actually going this afternoon. I can't get enough. Yeah. That's a guy that was like, I'm with him. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm not as, I'm not that good. I'm, I'm all right. I'm getting old, you know, I'm 35. So those days are behind me. But... Uh, shut up. <laughs> insurance uh, years. That's like 60. I know it's uh, insurance years. It's, I don't know. It's, it's nothing. I actually, yeah. I, I didn't shave, especially for today, just to show a little bit of white spots on my beard. There you go, man. Especially for that. Taxing. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So you prefer to kick with which part of the leg? So uh, I've really been working on my southpaw. I've been in southpaw for like 12 weeks now consistently. So my rear left is, is nice right now, I would, I would say. Kicking is my strong suit. And I've been working on my wheel kick, but uh, that's, that's okay. It's not great. So <laughs> there you go. I got to learn from you. You have the karate going. That's something I've always wanted to, to learn. It's different. It's, um, let's say, it's tr the traditional way. It's more discipline and we do the katas, but it's a, it's a little bit different. It's always interesting when MMA fighters integrate uh, 
karate, kung fu, um, you know, those traditional disciplines into their game, you can, you can see the difference in, in the way they uh, kickbox. So I, I always find it uh, fun to watch. Yeah, we can talk about techniques later on and hopefully in person because that's the only way that you can actually, you know, deliver that idea and, you know, yep. distancing, timing, all that yep. stuff. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> about getting the, the hip in. Uh, but let's, let's start, you know, uh, closing the, this beautiful conversation. And I'll ask you the same question that I ask everyone. Okay, we've been in the COVID for a while. Recommendation for a book or a good series or a movie to binge? Let's see. Gosh, there's so many. Um, if you haven't seen Queen's Gambit yet on Netflix, it's awesome. I actually read an article yesterday that like uh, vendors are sold out of chess sets because people watch Queen's Gambit and now they want to play chess. So uh, loved that series. Um, books wise, uh, I always recommend for insurance agents. And I uh, actually presented at the Beyond Insurance um, Conference two months ago. I did a seminar, an mm -hmm. um, hour long seminar on how to build a personalized insurance business. If you are an insurance agent or an agency owner, you have to read The One Thing by Gary Keller, the uh, CEO and co-founder of um, Keller Williams. And he talks about doing one thing in business and doing it so absolutely well and you will be wildly successful. I can't tell you how many agencies and agents I talk to that try to do too many things. They try to sell too many different products. They try to be a commercial agent, a personal agent, a life, a health. You know, then they're doing a little real estate on the side and it's like you never really get anywhere. Um, at our agency, we only did home and auto insurance. We didn't sell life, we didn't sell health, we didn't sell financial planning. And uh, we built a really nice business and sold it for a nice amount of money. And so that's a testament to the fact that if agents focus on one thing and do it extremely well, they'll make more money than they can imagine. And they'll be happier in their business because they're not always scrambling uh, to try to figure out, uh, you know, different segments. So that, I recommend that book for sure for any agent or agency owner. I love it. It's, it's a problem that we see everywhere. It's self -made. Yep meant it's oh maybe this maybe this maybe i will manage to sell this or finish that project and that project and that project. yeah love it love it yeah. ryan my friend thank you very very much for your time your energy and your knowledge i hope that we'll have another opportunity i love that uh, the lecture that you that you gave about how to build an agency hopefully we'll we'll get you back here and talk about that again Yep, I could talk about insurance all day. Gee, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. My pleasure, man. Thanks. Right.